Johann Gottlieb Fichte. Johann Gottlieb Fichte, May 19, 1762, January 27, 1814, was a German philosopher who became a founding figure of the philosophical movement known as German idealism, which developed from the theoretical and ethical writings of Immanuel Kant. Recently, philosophers and scholars have begun to appreciate Fichte as an important philosopher in his own right due to his original insights into the nature of self-consciousness or self-awareness. Fichte was also the originator of thesis antithesis synthesis, an idea that is often erroneously attributed to Hegel. Like Descartes and Kant before him, Fichte was motivated by the problem of subjectivity and consciousness. Fichte also wrote works of political philosophy, he has a reputation as one of the fathers of German nationalism. Fichte was born in Ramenau, Upper Lusatia. The son of the ribbon weaver, he came of peasant stock which had lived in the region for many generations. The family was noted in the neighborhood for its probity and piety. Christian Fichte, Johann Gottlieb's father, married somewhat above his station. It has been suggested that a certain impatience which Fichte himself displayed throughout his life was an inheritance from his mother. Young Fichte received the rudiments of his education from his father. He showed remarkable ability from an early age, and it was owing to his reputation among the villagers that he gained the opportunity for a better education than he otherwise would have received. The story runs that the Freiherr von Militz, a country landowner, arrived too late to hear the local pastor preach. He was, however, informed that a lad in the neighborhood would be able to repeat the sermon practically verbatim. As a result, the baron took the lad into his protection, which meant that he paid his tuition. Fichte was placed in the family of Pastor Krabel at Niederau near Meissen and they received thorough grounding in the classic stuff from this time onward, Fichte saw little of his parents. In October 1774, he was attending the celebrated foundation school at Pforta near Naumburg. This school is associated with the names of Novalis, August Wilhelm Schlegel, Friedrich Schlegel, and Nietzsche. The spirit of the institution was semi-monastic and, while the education given was excellent in its way, it is doubtful whether there was enough social life and contact with the world for a pupil of Fichte's temperament and antecedents. Perhaps his education strengthened a tendency toward introspection and independence, characteristics which appear strongly in his doctrines and writings. In 1780, he began study at the Theology Seminary of University of Jena. He was transferred a year later to study at the Leipzig University. Fichte seems to have supported himself at this period of bitter poverty and hard struggle. Freiherr von Militz continued to support him, but when he died in 1784, Fichte had to end his studies prematurely, without completing his degree. During the years 1784 to 1788, he supported himself in a precarious way as tutor in various Saxon families. In early 1788, he returned to Leipzig in the hope of finding a better employment, but eventually he had to settle for a much less promising position with the family of an innkeeper in Zurich. He lived in Zurich for the next two years, 1788 to 1790, which was a time of great contentment for him. There he met his future wife, Joanna Rahn, and Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. There he also became in 1793 a member of the Freemasonry Lodge Modestiacum Libertate with which Johann Wolfgang Goethe was also connected. In the spring of 1790, he became engaged to Joanna. In the summer of 1790, Fichte began to study the works of Kant, but this occurred initially because one of his students wanted to know about them. They had a lasting effect on the trajectory of his life and thought that while he was assimilating the Kantian philosophy and preparing to develop it, fate dealt him a blow, the Ron family had suffered financial reverses, and his impending marriage had to be postponed. From Zurich, Fichte returned to Leipzig in May 1790. In the spring of 1791, he obtained a tutorship at Warsaw in the house of a Polish nobleman. The situation, however, quickly proved disagreeable and he was released. He then got a chance to see Kant at Königsberg. After a disappointing interview on July 4 of the same year, he shut himself in his lodgings and threw all his energies into the composition of an essay which would compel Kant's attention and interest. This essay, completed in five weeks, was the Versuch einer Kritik alle Offenbarn, attempted a critique of all revelation. 1792. In this book, according to Henrik, Fichte investigated the connections between divine revelation and Kant's critical philosophy. The first edition of the book was published without Kant or Fichte's knowledge, moreover, without Fichte's name or signed preface. It was thus mistakenly thought to be a new work by Kant himself. Reviews were assuming Kant was the author when Kant cleared the confusion and openly praised the work and author. 
Fichte's reputation skyrocketed as many intellectuals of the day were the opinion that it was the most shocking and astonishing news. Since, nobody but Kant could have written this book. This amazing news of a third son in the philosophical heavens has set me into such confusion. Karl Popper considers the book as essentially a fraud which though rather boring cleverly imitated Kant's style and that the rumors that Kant himself had written the book to be contrived. Kant waited seven years to make public statement about the incident, after considerable external pressure he dissociated himself from Fichte. In his statement, he inscribed, May God protect us from our friends. From our enemies, we can try to protect ourselves. In October 1793, he was married in Zurich, where he remained the rest of the year. Stirred by the events and principles of the French Revolution, he wrote an anonymously published two pamphlets which led to him being seen as a devoted defender of liberty of thought and action and an advocate of political changes. In December of the same year, he received an invitation to fill the position of extraordinary professor of philosophy at the University of Jena. He accepted and began his lectures in May of the next year. With extraordinary zeal, he expounded his system of transcendental idealism. His success was immediate. He seems to have excelled as a lecturer because of the earnestness and force of his personality. These lectures were later published under the title The Vocation of the Scholar, Einige Verlesung in Überdeibisch Tim and Dagelerten. He gave himself up to intense production, and a succession of works soon appeared. After weathering a couple of academic storms, he was finally dismissed from Jena in 1799 as a result of a charge of atheism. He was accused of atheism in 1798 after publishing his essay Ue den Grunnunzers Glaubens and eine Gutliche Weltregierung, on the ground of our belief in a divine world governance, which he had written in response to Friedrich Karl Forberg's essay Development of the Concept of Religion, in his philosophical journal. For Fichte, God should be conceived primarily in moral terms, the living and efficaciously acting moral order is itself God. We require no other God, nor can we grasp any other, on the ground of our belief in the divine world governance. Fichte's intemperate appeal to the public, Appellation and Das Publicum, 1799, provoked F. H. Jacobi to publish an open letter to Fichte, in which he equated philosophy in general and Fichte's transcendental philosophy in particular with nihilism. Since all the German states except Prussia had joined in the cry against him, he was forced to go to Berlin. There he associated himself with the Schlegels, Schleiermacher, Schelling, and Tieck. In April 1800, through the introduction of Hungarian writer Ignaz Aurelius Fessler, he was initiated into Freemasonry in the Lodge Pythagoras of the Blazing Star where he was elected minor warden. At first Victor was a warm admirer of Fessler and was disposed to aid him in his proposed Masonic reform. But later he became Fessler's bitter opponent. Their controversy attracted much attention among Freemasons. Fichte presented two lectures on the philosophy of Masonry during the same period as part of his work on the development of various higher degrees for the Lodge in Berlin. A certain Johann Karl Christian Fischer, a high official of the Grand Orient, published those lectures in 1802-03 in two volumes under the title Philosophy of Freemasonry, Letters to Constant. Philosophy der More. Brief and constant, where constant referred to a fictitious non Mason. In November 1800, Fichte published The Closed Commercial State, a philosophical sketch as an appendix to the doctrine of right and an example of a future politics, der Geschlossen Handelsstadt. Ein Philosophischer Entwurf als Anhang zur Rechtsulher und Probiner Konflikt zu liefern den Politik, a philosophical statement of his property theory a historical analysis of European economic relations, and a political proposal for reforming them. In 1805, he was appointed to a professorship in Erlangen. The disaster at Jena in 1806, in which Napoleon completely crushed the Prussian army, drove him to Königsberg for a time, but he returned to Berlin in 1807 and continued his literary activity. The deplorable situation of Germany stirred him to the depths and led him to deliver the famous addresses to the German nation, Reden und die Deutsche Nation, 1808, which guided the uprising against Napoleon. He became a professor of the new university at Berlin founded in 1810. By the votes of his colleagues Fichte was unanimously elected its rector in the succeeding year. But, once more, his impetuosity and reforming zeal led to friction, and he resigned in 1812. The campaign against Napoleon began, and the hospitals at Berlin were soon full of patients. Fichte's wife devoted herself to nursing and caught a virulent fever. Just as she was recovering, he himself was stricken down. He died of typhus at the age of 51. His son, Emmanuel Hermann Fichte, 
July 18, 1796, August 8, 1879, also made contributions to philosophy. In mimicking Kant's difficult style, his critics argued that Fichte produced works that were barely intelligible. He made no hesitation in pluming himself on High's great skill in the shadowy and obscure, by often remarking to his pupils, that there was only one man in the world who could fully understand his writings, and even he was often at a loss to seize upon his real meaning. On the other hand, Fichte himself acknowledged the difficulty of his writings, but argued that his works were clear and transparent to those who made the effort to think without preconceptions and prejudices. Fichte did not endorse Kant's argument for the existence of noumena, of things in themselves, the supersensible reality beyond the categories of direct human perception. Fichte saw the rigorous and systematic separation of things in themselves, noumena, and things as they appear to us, phenomena as an invitation to skepticism. Rather than invite such skepticism, Fichte made the radical suggestion that we should throw out the notion of a noumenal world and instead accept the fact that consciousness does not have a grounding in a so called real world. In fact, Fichte achieved fame for originating the argument that consciousness is not grounded in anything outside of itself. The phenomenal world as such, arises from self-consciousness, the activity of the ego, and moral awareness. His student, and critic, Arthur Schopenhauer, wrote. Søren Kierkegaard was also a student of the writings of Fichte. In his work Foundations of Natural Right, 1797. Fichte argued that self-consciousness was a social phenomenon, an important step and perhaps the first clear step taken in this direction by modern philosophy. A necessary condition of every subject's self-awareness, for Fichte, is the existence of other rational subjects. These others call or summon, for to nouth, the subject or self out of its unconsciousness and into an awareness of itself as a free individual. Fichte's account proceeds from the general principle that the I, Dossic, must posit itself as an individual in order to posit, Zetzen, itself at all, and that in order to posit itself as an individual it must recognize itself as it were to a calling or summons, auf order und, by other free individuals, called, moreover, to limit its own freedom out of respect for the freedom of the other. The same condition applied and applies, of course, to the others in its development. Hence, mutual recognition, g. Gensidig Anerkennen of rational individuals turns out to be a condition necessary for the individual I in general. This argument for intersubjectivity is central to the conception of selfhood developed in the foundations of the science of knowledge, Grundlage der Gesamten Wissenschaftslehre, 1794-1795. In Fichte's view consciousness of the self depends upon resistance or a check by something that is understood as not part of the self yet is not immediately ascribable to a particular sensory perception. In his later 1796 to 1799 lectures, his Nova Methodo, Fichte incorporated it into his revised presentation of the very foundations of his system, where the summons takes its place alongside original feeling, which takes the place of the earlier ants toss, see below, as both a limit upon the absolute freedom of the eye and a condition for the positing of the same. The eye itself posits this situation for itself. To posit does not mean to create the objects of consciousness. The principle in question simply states that the essence of an eye lies in the assertion of one's own self-identity, i.e., that consciousness presupposes self-consciousness. Such immediate self-identity, however, cannot be understood as a psychological fact, nor as an act or accident of some previously existing substance or being dotted as an action of the eye, but one that is identical with the very existence of this same eye. In Fichte's technical terminology, the original unity of self-consciousness is to be understood both as an action and as the product of the same I, as a fact and or act, that handlung, modern German, tat handlung, a unity that is presupposed by and contained within every fact and every act of empirical consciousness, although it never appears as such therein. The I must posit itself in order to be an I at all, but it can posit itself only insofar as it posits itself as limited. Moreover, it cannot even posit for itself its own limitations, in the sense of producing or creating these limits. The finite eye cannot be the ground of its own passivity. Instead, for Fichte, if the eye is to posit itself off at all, it must simply discover itself to be limited, a discovery that Fichte characterizes as an impulse, repulse, or resistance, anstos, modern German, anstos, to the free practical activity of the eye such an original limitation of the eye is, however, a limit for the eye only insofar as the eye posits it out is a limit. The eye does this, according to Fichte's analysis, by positing its own limitation, first, as only a feeling, 
then is a sensation, then is an intuition of a thing, and finally is a summons of another person. The instas thus provides the essential impetus that first posits in motion the entire complex train of activities that finally result in our conscious experience both of ourselves and others as empirical individuals and of the world around us. Though Anstas plays a similar role as the thing in itself does in Kantian philosophy, unlike Kant, Fichte's Anstas is not something foreign to the I instead, it denotes the original encounter of the I with its own finitude. Rather than claim that the not I, Das Nichtig, is the cause or ground of the Anstas, Fichte argues that not I is posited by the I precisely in order to explain to itself the Anstas, that is, in order to become conscious of Anstas. Though the Wissenschaftsleher demonstrates that such an anstas must occur if self-consciousness is to come about, it is quite unable to deduce or to explain the actual occurrence of such an anstas, except as a condition for the possibility of consciousness. Accordingly, there are strict limits to what can be expected from any a priori deduction of experience, and this limitation, for Fichte, equally applies to Kant's transcendental philosophy. According to Fichte, Transcendental philosophy can explain that the world must have space, time, and causality, but it can never explain why objects have the particular sensible properties they happen to have or why I am this determinate individual rather than another. This is something that the I simply has to discover at the same time that it discovers its own freedom, and indeed, as a condition for the latter. Dieter Henrich, 1966, proposed that Fichte was able to move beyond a reflective theory of consciousness. According to Fichte, the self must already have some prior acquaintance with itself, independent of the act of reflection, no object comes to consciousness except under the condition that I am aware of myself, the conscious subject, Jed's object kommt zum Bewusstsein lediglich unter der Bedingung, dass ich auch meine selbst, die Bewusstsein und in subjects mir bewusst say. This idea is what Henrik called Fichte's original insight. Fichte also developed a theory of the state based on the idea of self-sufficiency. In his mind, the state should control international relations, the value of money, and remain an autarky. Because of this necessity to have relations with other rational beings in order to achieve consciousness, Fichte writes that there must be a relation of right, in which there is a mutual recognition of rationality by both parties. Between December 1807 and March 1808, Fichte gave a series of lectures concerning the German nation and its culture and language projecting the kind of national education he hoped would raise it from the humiliation of its defeat at the hands of the French. Having been a supporter of revolutionary France, Fichte became disenchanted by 1804 as Napoleon's armies advanced through Europe, occupying German territories, stripping them of their raw materials and subjugating them to foreign rule. Consequently, Fichte came to believe Germany would be responsible to carry the virtues of the French Revolution into the future. Furthermore, his nationalism was not aroused by Prussian military defeat and humiliation, for these had not yet occurred, but resulted from devotion to his own humanitarian philosophy. Through disappointment in the French he turned to the German nation as the instrument of fulfilling it. These lectures, entitled The Addresses to the German Nation, coincided with a period of reform in the Prussian government, under the chancellorship of Baron von Stein. The addresses display Fichte's interest during that period in language and culture as vehicles of human spirit to all development. Fichte built upon the earlier ideas of Johann Gottfried Herder and attempted to unite them with his more systematic approach. The aim of the German nation, according to Fichte, was to found an empire of spirit and reason, and to annihilate completely the crude physical force that rules of the world. Like Herder's German nationalism, Fichte's was wholly cultural, and grounded in the aesthetic, literary, and moral. The nationalism propounded by Fichte in the addresses would be appealed to over a century later by the Nazi party in Germany, which sought in Fichte a forerunner to its own nationalist ideology. Like Nietzsche, the association of Fichte with the Nazi regime came to color readings of Fichte's German nationalism in the post-war period. This reading of Fichte was often bolstered through reference to an unpublished letter from 1793, Contributions to the Correction of Public's Judgment Concerning the French Revolution wherein Fichte expressed anti-Semitic sentiments, such as arguing against extending civil rights to Jews and calling them a state within a state that could undermine the German nation. Ref name equals Gazomtauskaba I slash 1 pp.292 greater than Gazomtauskaba, I slash 1, pages 292 to 293 less than slash ref however, attached to the letter is a footnote in which Fichte provides an impassioned plea for permitting Jews to practice their religion without hindrance. Furthermore, 
The final act of Fichte's academic career was to resign as rector of Humboldt University in protest when his colleagues refused to punish the harassment of Jewish students. While recent scholarship has sought to dissociate Fichte's writings on nationalism with his adoption by the Nazi party, the association continues to blight his legacy, although Fichte, as if to exclude all ground of doubt, clearly and distinctly prohibits, in his reworked version of the science of ethics as based on the science of knowledge, see section final period in Berlin, genocide and other crimes against humanity. Fichte argued that active citizenship, civic freedom and even property rights should be withheld from women, whose calling was to subject themselves utter light to the authority of their fathers and husbands. Fichte gave a wide range of public and private lectures in Berlin from the last decade of his life. These form some of his best-known work, and are the basis of a revived German-speaking scholarly interest in his work. The lectures include two works from 1806. In the characteristics of the present age, Die Grundsuch der Jägen Wartigen Zeitalters, Fichte outlines his theory of different historical and cultural epochs. His mystic work The Way Towards the Blessed Life, Dian Weisung zum Seligen Leben oder Ach die Religion Silher, gave his fullest thoughts on religion. In 1808 he gave a series of speeches in French-occupied Berlin, addresses to the German nation. In 1810, the new University of Berlin was set up, designed along lines put forward by Wilhelm von Humboldt. Fichte was made its rector and also the first chair of philosophy. This was in part because of educational themes in the addresses, and in part because of his earlier work at Jena University. Fichte lectured on further versions of his Wissenschaftsleher. Of these, he only published a brief work from 1810, The Science of Knowledge and Its General Outline, Die Wissenschaftsleher, in Niram Gemeinen und Umrestargestelt, also translated as Outline of the Doctrine of Knowledge. His son published some of these 30 years after his death. Most only became public in the last decades of the 20th century, in his collected works. This included reworked versions of the Doctrine of Science, Wissenschaftsleher, 1810-1813, The Science of Rights, Das System der Rechselher, 1812, and The Science of Ethics as Based on the Science of Knowledge, Das System der Sittenlehr nach den Prinzipien der Wissenschaftsleher, 1812, 1st ed., 1798. The new standard edition of Fichte's works in German, which supersedes all previous editions, is the Gesamthausgabe, Collected Works or Complete Edition, commonly abbreviated as GA, prepared by the Bavarian Academy of Sciences, Gesamthausgabe der Bayerischen Akademie der Wissenschaften, 42 volumes, edited by, Hans Golowitzki, Eric Fuchs, and Peter Schneider, Stuttgart Bad Cannstatt, Frommen Hall's book, 1962-2012. It is organized into four parts. Fichte's works are quoted and cited from G.A., followed by a combination of Roman and Arabic numbers, indicating the series and volume, respectively, and the page numbers. Another edition is Johann Gottlieb Fichte's Sammelisch Werke, abbreviated S.W., ed. I. H. Fichte. Berlin, De Gruyter, 1971. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.